Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today I wanted to dedicate an episode on everything to do with channeling. What is channeling? Why channel? How to channel? The history of channeling. Is it good or is it bad? How do we evaluate channeling? I looked back on recent episodes and sort of discovered a lot of times I was talking about channeled works. I've discussed the law of one. I've interviewed Cindy Edison and Ramona Gailey, who does Oprah and Joseph. So I've had the opportunity to interview channeled beings. And I think that it's incredibly fascinating. I have episodes where I've read channeled works by Seth. And of course, the many episodes where we talked about the law of one, I've talked about it in interviews. So I wanted to treat this episode as a way to compile it, some of this information, so that you can decide how to evaluate these channeled works. There's also a great book that I recommend by Carla Ruckert, who was the channel for the law of one sessions called a channeling handbook. There's no absolute way for you to evaluate any channel but within yourself. It is possible that every single channel is just that person talking. In many cases, it would seem to be incredibly unlikely, but human beings are amazing. If you look at the great number of fictional works that have been produced on the scale of the Game of Thrones or the Lord of the Rings, people can create incredible fantasy worlds. So when you hear channeled works, there is a tendency sometimes to either completely ignore it or to give it too much credibility. I've seen this many times. And I understand the place where people would want to channel. Sometimes you want to talk about stuff, but you don't want to provide the evidence behind what you're saying. If I get up in front of a group of people and I say, if you go to sleep at nine o'clock every day, then you'll have a better life. Well, I would need to provide evidence and examples of what I'm doing. But if a channeled being says that, they can just say, and you must go to sleep at nine o'clock, and then you don't question it. When Abraham, who is one of my favorites, I've seen Abraham live, and the reason it tripped me out is I could see it. I can see auras, so I could see there was something extra going on. I could feel the presence of Abraham. But that's a personal thing, and maybe that's something that I created as well. But it does not matter in many cases. In many of these channelings, it doesn't matter that the being is channeling anything. It's the information coming out and how I'm accessing it. Oftentimes when I'm listening to Seth, I'm not thinking about whether or not Seth is channeled. It's just a very good argument that he's making. He's making very clear points of analysis. Abraham is incredibly uplifting and has helped me on a psychological level so many times. I don't care if it's real or not. I believe that it's real. But I get that question a lot. How do you evaluate these channelings? I think that in my own life, I've only chosen to channel my higher self. There's a part of me that's a little afraid. I don't want to open the door to some or any being. If you read about the channelings that were done for the Law of One, now if nobody knows about the Law of One, there is a group of channeled sessions from 1981 through 1984. In that channeling, It was Carla Ruckert, Don Elkins, and Jim McCarty. What they did was they had three people. One person would just write down the answers. One would ask questions. And one person was completely out. There's so many different levels of channeling. It may be possible that every single fictional writer out there is channeling information. If you think about what we discuss as moving into the fourth density, into a social memory complex where everybody can read each other's minds and we have access to the conscious Akashic record, we are going to start getting more and more information that appears to be channeled. And it may not necessarily be channeled. It could be a memory that is a shared memory in group consciousness. As I've mentioned, when I read authors, I feel like sometimes they're with me. I can hear what they're thinking and and their thoughts, and perhaps I'm receiving an impression from the Akashic Record. The only person that I truly want to channel is my higher self, and I have an ongoing relationship with my higher self, and I trust my higher self. 
And sometimes my higher self doesn't want to answer. And I know how my higher self feels. I felt my higher self come into my body and look around. It is mind blowing to think about. And I've had times when I felt like that my higher self came through when I'm doing these episodes. I wouldn't come and tell you that I was channeling anything but myself, but it felt like it was channeled. Like I don't remember saying something in particular. But as a researcher, I know about the history of channeling and there are people that come from a Christian background that are afraid of channeling. They're horrified that there could be evil spirits. So you have to come to an understanding of what negative entities are and that they can in the case of the law of one material. When you read all the sessions, they had a negative entity attacking one of the members just because the information was so sacred and attempting to kill her. So yes, some of these entities can be negative. Some of them can want to make you look like a fool. They may be aware of your actual intentions. There's always two sides of it. In the case of Carla Ruckert, who was the channel for many of these channelings, she would challenge the entity in the name of whatever was closest or highest to her. She was somebody that had been very Christian and believed in Jesus and would challenge the entity in Jesus' name, which was a feeling in her heart, which she did. But they had to perform a particular ceremony when they did those channelings. If you check out my interview with Jim McCarty, he gives the exact description of the ceremony that was provided. We see all the time people that are channeling. Now, the Dolores Cannon material is not necessarily channeled. She would say it was not channeled. She was t speaking to incarnations of previous people. And sometimes there were entities that would walk in but she seemed to differentiate it from channeling, but it was very much like a channeling that would occur. So there are a bunch of recorded works of channelings before the law of one material. It's certainly possible that material came from Carla Records. And it's really interesting what to think. There is a history behind channeling. Obviously, a large chunk of the Bible is channeled. One incredibly fascinating work is Oaspe. It's O-A-H-S-P-E. A massive book that is like the Bible. It is mentioned in the Law of One as being approved by the council. People have channeled the council. People have channeled something called Urantia, this gigantic book that talks about the universe in a completely different way. There are channelings that obviously contradict with each other all the time. I'm very interested in Dronvalo Melchizedek and the Thot information, and it seems to be channeled. But how do I consider this with the law of one information? How do I compare it? One entity could be intending to distort the truth, and one could be trying to portray the truth. Who knows? I always found the raw material more credible because they only answered questions. The ways that they answered the questions were very legitimate. But let's look at the deeper story about channeling and the histories of it. There is so much channeling that we can talk about. In most cases, you'll just see somebody close their eyes and their lips for a minute or two, sitting with quiet focus and they breathe in usually big up volume of air and then suddenly a personality takes over or a different voice will speak and it really has become one of the paramount landmarks of the new age movement and has been since the late 80s been something more than what had been before it's more important than herbal cures and astrology and all of the different things that people relate to the new age movement and to monitor this wave there's so much information as somebody that loves to read i can't even discuss all of the channel information just that's on youtube but its influence is propagated through multiple avenues radio and tv interviews private channeling sessions a lot of the stuff we never hear are governments hearing channeled sessions from aliens? Are they using channeling? Is that how we 
communicate with aliens would make sense wouldn't it if they had the ability to channel with us that would be the fastest and most direct means of communication so how do we evaluate it people sell videos and and newsletters and magazines and seminars and conferences it is a business one article I found says the net profits have been estimated at $400 million annually from channeling. What is channeling? John Klimo, author of a pretty sympathetic yet thorough survey of channeling that I found, says it is a phenomenon in which otherwise ordinary people seem to let themselves be taken over or in other ways receive messages from another personality who uses them as a conduit medium or channel for the communication hence the term medium or channel some of the more interesting works that i find credible where they don't claim they're channeling but clearly there's some channeling going on like the joseph benner information one of the more popular channelers is jay-z knight she channels ramtha also known as the Ram, supposedly a 35,000-year-old being from Atlantis who invented the practice of war. There's Martin Gardner who summarized the Ramtha story. Slowly he came to realize that he himself was part of the God he hated. After 63 out-of-body experiences, his body vibrating faster than light, he became one with the wind on the side of Mount Indus in Tibet, free of weight, he ascended into the seventh heaven where he and God became one. He is now part of an unseen brotherhood of super beings who love us and need hear our prayers. Ramtha has made night, obviously, a million, millions of dollars, several times over. She's had the name Ramtha copyrighted to prevent anyone else from channeling him. So Penny Torres and Jack Purcell are competitors and they would penny would channel mafu a highly evolved being from the seventh dimension last seen on earth when he incarnated as a leper in the first century pompeii and mafu like ramtha speaks with a slavic accent and then jack purcell channels lazarus a group being from beyond time and space who has never been embodied in our dimension lazarus speaks with a lisp the range of entities supposedly being channeled is unlimited there's a magazine that you can find called spirit speaks from this californian and it's a reader's digest of messages from various channeled entities some of its regular contributors are doug how lee a tibetan monk from 2600 years ago or gabrielle an angel or dr peebles a scottish physician from the 1800s and Zush, a non-physical being from Alpha Centauri. An excellent survey of the channeling scene from a Christian perspective in another article is provided in a book by John Ankerberg and John Weldon, and they note that the personalities being channeled claim to be various aspects of the human mind or the collective mind of humanity. They also claim to be the Holy Spirit, troubled ghosts, the spirit of animals and plants, multiple human personalities, the inhabitants of mythical cultures, Atlantis and Lemuria, and often possibly alien computers and AIs. Bashar, who is one of my favorite channelers, claims to be an AI, sort of, as best I can understand it, and also the higher self of the channel, which in that case evaluate the information. It's, it's incredibly interesting. Now, historically, critics realizing that some people are claiming to channel dolphins and other spirits uh, have come to conclude that we are insane as a nation with all this channeling. Of course, there's always going to be people that are going to say that. Channeling activity understood in its wider sense to include spirit possession in general can be traced back to the earliest times and civilizations. The acceptance of animism, the belief that spirits are present in all of nature, including plants, inert objects, and seasons, or the practice of ancestor veneration have provided primitive cultures with sufficient groundwork for the rise of spiritism. 
certainly spirit mediumship which is what my grandmother did she was a very famous spirit medium in Nebraska and I've got the chance to hold her crystal ball uh, so spirit mediums and and as well as t attempts at spirit control can be seen in shamanism witch doctors and magicians and healers channeling can be traced back to ancient religions of Egypt and India and the Near East the commandments given to Moses after the exodus from Egypt expressly forbid communication with spirit mediums about 1400 BC Leviticus 1931 or going to one who inquires of the dead Deuteronomy 18.11, Mosaic Law prescribed the death penalty both for the medium and for the person who sought out the medium for advice in Leviticus 26.27. Indeed, one of the chief reasons that King Saul, the first king of Israel, was slain was going to one who had a familiar spirit to inquire of it in Chronicles 10.13. 700 years after Mount Sinai in the days of Isaiah, the prohibition still remained. Those who sought information from mediums and wizards were to be answered brusquely. Should not a people seek their God instead? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Isaiah 8.19 In New Testament times, possession and control by discarnate spirits were accepted realities. The actions of Jesus in casting out demons and unclean spirits are mentioned repeatedly in the New Testament. Matthew 8, 28, 9, 32, 12, 22, and 17, 14. Jesus likewise commissioned his apostles to cast out demons, Matthew 10, 1, and gave his authority to others not numbered among the twelve, Luke 10, 17. The early church continued to conduct exorcisms, Acts 8, 7. I'm not implying that these are demons. But people in Christian belief systems equate channelings with evil demons. So I wanted to discuss this. An interesting incident regarding a channeler appears in the 16th chapter of the Act of Apostles, where Paul and Silas were evangelizing in Philippi, a city of Western Greece. They were persistently followed by a slave girl with a spirit of divination. Acts 16.16 the Greek text literally reads a python spirit, a reference to an entity named the python which inhabited the high priestess of the temple of Apollo at Delphi. Remember hearing about the oracle of Delphi in school, that was her. The python or python spirit later became a generic term for a discarnate entity which predicted the future. The apostle Paul finally turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out that very hour. It bears noting that this spirit of divination evidently could provide some genuine information. In verse 16, this was not a natural ability, nor was the woman using methods of fraud or cold reading because when Paul cast out the spirit, she lost her powers and the ability to make money for her owners. If the woman had seen drawing upon a talent or using a swindle technique, she should still have been able to earn money by deception, as previously, in any case, this was not a power the Lord wanted in her life, and through the authority of Jesus Christ, it was cast out in the Bible. For centuries among monotheistic cultures, spirit communication was usually limited to spirits of divine origin, God, Jesus, or the angels. Muhammad claims multiple encounters with the angel Gabriel, whose messages are preserved in the Quran. In the Middle Ages, Roman Catholic mystics were permitted visions and appearances of Jesus or the Virgin Mary. One of the really interesting ones is Emanuel Swedenborg, who I became aware of through William Blake when I read and check out my episode where I read The Marriage Between Heaven and Hell. He refers to Swedenborg. Now, the story behind him is amazing. The, he was this brilliant metallurgist, inventor, and scientist in the 18th century. And he abandons his career because he is visited by angels and he can give full descriptions of the afterlife in heaven. 
claiming to be in contact with angels. He wrote these treatises and commentaries based on these visions and communications and founded a major cultic movement influential among European and American intellectuals. In the 19th century, America's several cults such as Mormons and the Shakers, now you don't may not say that Mormons are a cult, that's they're not. They claimed communion with angels or spirits of the dead. Those are other religions. They're all the same religion. Mary Baker Eddy often attempted to distinguish Christian science from spiritualism, yet she herself acted as a trance channeler briefly before discovering Christian science. In the life of Mary Baker G. Eddy and the history of Christian science, Georgine Milmine describes experiences of Mary Baker Patterson. Mary Baker Patterson channeled the spirit of her dead brother, Albert. Milmine's book reproduces a photographic of automatic writing purportedly from Albert in Mary's hand. Two years later, in the company of other spiritualists, Mrs. Patterson acted as a trance medium, this time claiming to channel only the spirits of the apostles and of Jesus Christ. One of the interesting channelings is the Course of Miracles, in which the entity never identifies themselves. And uh, later you get the implication that it's actually Jesus being channeled or channeling this work. One of my favorite channelings of all time is Paul Selig. And each book kind of builds on itself. The information really feels energetic. And I recommend reading any and all of Paul Selig's books. He claims to be channeling Melchizedek. The channeling floodgates opened in this country in the mid-19th century with the advent of spiritualism and the attempt to communicate with spirits of the dead. Historians almost universally trace the origin of the spiritual movement. Margaret was 14 and Kate was 11 when they first heard the sounds of knocking furniture being moved and other sounds in various rooms of their home in 1847. And that was the Fox sisters. And the children were terrified. And Mrs. Fox's hair turned white and through this ordeal, I'm sure there's a movie about it. And on the night of March 31st, 1848, 12-year-old Kate challenged these unseen powers to repeat the snaps of her fingers, which they did. Each number of snaps would be followed by the same number of raps, and thus the girls began to communicate with the spirits. News spread rapidly, and the home was visited by interested writers and curiosity seekers. The sisters began to hold seances, communicating with the spirits by means of a simple code. And in mid-April, Kate's parents sent her away to live with her older sister, to quell the disruption it had caused. The wrappings immediately spread to Leah's house and Leah had become a believer. Who knows? The first message was, Dear friends, you must proclaim these truths to the world. This is the dawning of a new era and you must not try to conceal it any longer. When you do your duty, God will protect you and good spirits will watch over you. Fascination with spiritualism spread like wildfire, and within 30 years, there were tens of thousands of spiritualists in the U.S., England, and across Europe, and national organizations were formed. In 1855, the first national spiritualist newspaper was issued in England. In 1866, a national conference was held in Rhode Island, where resolutions were passed that citizens should abandon all Christian ordinances and worship and close down all Sunday schools. In 1870, Sir William Crookes, famed British scientist who invented the Crookes tube, the beginnings of the modern picture tube, called on the nation's scientists to investigate spiritualism, seeking to contact his dead daughter. Crookes was convinced of spiritualism's validity. Queen Victoria consulted several mediums, hoping to speak with her late husband, Prince Albert, who died in 1861. Seances were held at the White House under Lincoln's presidency, British Prime Minister William Gladstone, Canadian Prime Minister Mackenzie King, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle were all converts to spiritualism. Famed magician and escape artist Harry Houdini tried to prevent Conan Doyle from being duped by crank mediums, but Doyle remained convinced that the spiritualist had true supernatural powers. He believed spiritualism was a new revelation to mankind. Check out my episode on The Council that I released that, where Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, is channeling The Council where he may have gotten the information on the Star Trek Federation. Christianity must be modified by this new revelation, Doyle said when he was writing about this. 
One can see no justice in a vicarious sacrifice, nor in the God who could be placated by such means. Above all, many cannot understand such expressions as the redemption from sin, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and so forth. Houdini's 1924 autobiography is fascinating account of the origins and numerous frauds connected with spiritualism. And after 30 years of research, he wrote, I have accumulated one of the largest libraries in the world of psychic phenomena, spiritualism, magic, witchcraft, demonology, some of the material going back to 1489, but nothing I have ever read concerning the so-called spiritualistic phenomenon has impressed me as being genu genuine. It was not Houdini, however, who struck the greatest blow against it. It was the fact that Margaret and Kate Fox later confessed that they were lying and using their stocking feet they would use a small pine table and stage the taps so obviously some of these channels have been faked and they are fake who knows in the 21st in the 20th century spiritualism had did not disappear in fact it diversified into spiritualist sects which were anti-Christian, mildly anti-Christian, and pro-Christian. One of the interesting and most favorite is the sleeping prophet Edgar Casey, which I have had several episodes that I've discussed. And Casey was raised in rural Kentucky. His parents were Campbellites. He claimed to see little people as a child. The turning point in his life occurred in 1901. At the age of 24, Casey had been suffering from a chronic case of laryngitis and voice loss. After contracting a cold a year earlier in desperation he turned to a hypnotist al lane after case had entered a deep trance lane asked him to diagnose the cause of his hoarseness immediately the fateful words came forth yes we can see the body the voice diagnosed the problem as insufficient circulation lane gave a suggestion that the body cure itself casey's neck grew pink then bright red 20 minutes later it became normal again Lane told Casey to wake up, and when he did, his voice had returned. So Casey's life was changed permanently. News of the story spread, and his neighbors asked him to diagnose their diseases for them. Casey learned how to put himself in a trance state fairly quickly, and after he appeared to fall asleep, the voice would take over and prescribe various unorthodox cures, which always seemed to work. Eventually, the questioners began to ask him about spiritual matters, and from then on, Casey channeled metaphysical truths, promoting reincarnation, monism, astrology, Gnosticism, Atlantis, mediumship. Casey's followers were devoted to these readings, and over 14,000 trance sessions have been transcribed and cataloged and indexed. Equally potent has been the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ. That's another interesting one, published in 1907 channeled through Levi Dowling, who was purportedly empowered to read the Akashic Records. Levi's Aquarian Gospel has provided a mythical history of the life of Christ, picked up by many cults and New Age devotees. It describes a reincarnated Jesus who attained Christ consciousness after visiting G Egypt, Greece, and India during the so-called silent years before his public ministry in Palestine. For a book transcribed but in the akashic records it's got a bunch of errors in it for instance herod antipas was a ruler of jerusalem when jesus was born and that should have been herod the great not herod antipas there's people have pointed out different mistakes in that book and the arantia book as i mentioned was also obtained through trans channeling in the early 1900s ironically it was a seventh-day adventist minister who had spent over a decade debunking and refuting spiritualism there's a really good book by Dr. William Sadler on how that particular channeler was a fraud and the entities were utterly inexplicable and made no sense. And in the Law of One material, they also said that those were channeled by entities from the inner planes, which implies that it could have been evil entities so the urantia may not be completely legitimate but i have had a discussion about urantia on the mind escape podcast which was really good and i recommend that one 
And beginning in 1923, Dr. Sadler invited a group of friends, informally known as the Forum, to examine and question these intelligences, which were rapidly becoming more numerous. The channeler began producing automatic writing in response to their questions. The entities asked by Dr. Sadler, by now a true believer that the work be, he published, though it wasn't until 1955, that the 2100 page volume made it into print. The Arantia book has influenced thousands of people and is fully consistent with new age ideology on some levels. It would be hard to say just where modern channeling practices should be dated from, but a good beginning is the Seth material. Then I have about five episodes on the channel where I've read some Seth stuff were channeled through the late Jane Roberts who died in 1984. And she was a housewife and would-be writer who first encountered Seth through a spontaneous experience. Jane said, a fantastic avalanche of radical new ideas burst into my head with tremendous force, not unlike an LSD trip. Jane transmitted this material over 20 years, and like most channeled writing, it is amazingly consistent with New Age philosophy. Jane Roberts was the first contemporary channeler to gain widespread acceptance in the 1970s, and since then the volume of channelers and channeled writings has fallen on our society like a deluge. How does channeling fit? How do we apply it? In an interview with Joel Bjorling, an author of a bibliography on channeling, since he's up to his eyeballs in studying channeled writings, he was asked how contemporary channeling differs from its 19th century predecessor. He pointed out that in terms of content, both have the same philosophy and share a common root. The outward phenomenon is also similar. In both cases, a disembodied entity speaks through the channeler, usually in a trance state. One difference this author has observed is that the spiritualist movement focused on seances like dim lights and invocations and supernatural manifestations, table lifting and direct voice phenomenon. Today's channelers do everything under bright lights, usually on stage, an only visible event when an alien personality takes them over. The channelers usually don't exhibit the powers or physical phenomena, such as levitation, that were present in spiritualism. So the spiritualists probably are more false. Basic themes have also differed. In spiritualism, the emphasis was on proof of survival after death, and the public largely sought reassurance that their deceased loved ones are happy in the great beyond. In modern channeling, the focus is on higher intelligences who have come to teach us truth, showing us how to alter reality and achieve self-fulfillment. Modern channeling centers around themes of we are all God, there is no death, reality is a product of the mind, prosperity is our right and we can have it all, and we must preserve the earth from nuclear or ecological dis disaster. This last point is especially prevalent among UFO contactees who communicate telepathically with, with different aliens, except when it comes to the confederation. The channeled writings and records coming from the confederation prior to the raw channelings are so good, so profound. I've obtained copies of some of the channelings and they are just mind blowing in the information that they provided. And in a period of time in the seventies, they documented every channeling and Carla Rucker really examines how channeling is done through the confederation, how the, how you can channel the confederation, how you can hear the voices of the confederation. Channeling appears to be done best in a groups. And I wanted to read some of the stuff about those channelings. But I want to just say is this idea that it's all satanic. It's just not all satanic. There may be people that are using it to make money. Obviously there's some that are intentional fakers. But some of it may come from the unconscious self-will. Maybe some of it's coming from the memories of past lives. But I don't believe that it's coming from demons, but it could be coming from negative entities. So the best place to talk about channeling is in the writings of Carla Ruckert. 
Carla Ruckert in her book on channeling says that channeling is the reproduction by words or sounds of concepts not generated within one's own conscious mind, but transmitted from the subconscious mind or through the subconscious mind into the conscious mind from an impersonal or non-personal entity or principle. A good analogy to channeling would be the pipe which carries water. The pipe does not create the water, but rather receives it from the source external to its identity. In many ways, channeling could be the ultimate creative exercise. If you just pretend that you're channeling, you're going to come up with some amazing information. And it's also a meditative technique. In learning how to accept this information, there's something that happens with yourself. So you may be able to channel information. Are we all channeling on some level? When she talks about the Piper Channel, there are things a Piper Channel can be and do to enhance the delivery of pure channeling. It can keep itself clean and free from corrosion. It can remove obstruction. It can strengthen its walls or enlarge its diameter. It can make new connections. The only control it has over the water it channels through itself is the care with which it has allowed itself to be connected. The only control a pipe has over the appropriateness of the position and place of water is in the positioning that's open. Carla explains there are too many kinds of channeling to mention. Perhaps the image which represents channeling to the average person is that of the spiritualist seance. In this practice, a medium sits with a group of people who wish to communicate with ghosts. This form of mediumship is not the kind of channeling about which I know much. And those who wish to learn to be spiritualistic mediums are advised to go to a spiritualistic church and inquire as to where the nearest center is that offers such a course of teaching. I note this not because I have disapproval of the practice, nor because I am unfamiliar with the practice, but because it and other well-established and thorough schools of mediumship, the American Indian tradition and its medicine men and women are another good example, offer a perfectly adequate and perhaps somewhat specialized form of instruction to interested students. What other types of channeling are there then? The religious and traditional. For one, the prophets and some few saints in the Christian church were channels. The Old Testament is filled with the beauty of the prophets' words, most notably Isaiah's, whose words about the sacrificial lamb were so very prophetic of the incarnation of Jesus the Christ. These holy men and women saw visions, heard voices. Moses, in fact, heard the words of the Lord straight out and merely reported on the conversation. Then there are the New Age religions and independent but vaguely Christian sources which channel archangels, lesser angelic presences, spiritual masters of various kinds, such as Kuthumi, and of course Jesus under various names. And some of the best of this kind of channeling is uplifted and one's feelings are elevated to a rarefied joy by the inspirational writing of the channel. The religious channel has an obvious bias and consequently the message does not get through to everyone who happens to read the material. The Bible, for example, is the best-selling channeling of all time, but it does not appeal to every reader, and many are the Bibles which carry far more dust than fingerprints. There are fairies, yes, and Tinkerbell. I will clap for you. Such are the musings of one who is seriously studying the work of nature spirits of medicine, men, and women in the American Indian tradition. Findhorn's account of the contact with planet divas and subsequent growing of very large and healthy vegetables in the barren, sandy soil of the northern coast of Scotland is the most impressive. There's a large variety of purported UFO contactees. Philos, Clarion, and George Hunt Williamson's channeling of Brother Philip all speak of themselves allegedly extraterrestrial contacts, and there are many channels of a group calling itself the Federation of Planets, the Confederation of Planets, the Confederation of Planets in service of the Infinite Creator. I myself am one of those channels, Carla says. Especially interesting is the channeling of the Vinod and the Prober of the Nine, and the channeling which was only possible by Yuri Geller's presence of the Huva. I have read some of that in another channeling by the Council, and I found it to be hard to understand. So, why channel? 
you can see there's a plethora of channel material available. The information has tends to have a pervasively common theme, such as the ascendancy of the rightness of peace between peoples and goodwill. There are many inheritance of orthodox body of channel material such as Jews and Christians who would suggest that the truth has already been given. Many, especially in the Christian tradition, feel that all latter-day channeling is satanic in nature and there is scripture to support almost any point of view. Southerners before the war between the states used scripture to rationalize and support the practice of slavery. And it is not surprising that one may find scriptural passages both to commend the careful use of discernment of spirits and to condemn the same channeling as mediumship which is punishable by death. The acceptance of either point of view without discriminating thought is not recommended. However, any student who wishes to explore the possibility of becoming a channel needs to reckon with the probable reaction of the very ones you love the most if they are fundamental Christians, and perhaps even if they are not, they will find such activity frightening and may interpret you as doing the form of satanic possession. If your desire to channel is strong enough to withstand others' bad opinions, then fine. If you are potentially ready to lose a husband or a family or a friendship because of your desires to channel, then stop and think because you are on the track that you should be on. If you are serene and humble, your family will gradually relax. It is especially to be pointed out that those who do become channels and do encounter this reaction from those they love need to refrain from defending themselves, for it is totally unethical for a channel to present itself as a stumbling block in the way of another seeker's spiritual path. That's just not fair. You do not feel happy when you are criticized. Avoid criticizing others. Many of you listening to this are probably possessed by a curiosity about this very interesting phenomenon of channeling. There is nothing wrong with curiosity. It is commendable. Before you channel, Carla recommends finding peace and silence and learning how to meditate. The peaceful part is important. There are some great coaches out there that can teach you how to channel. In another book, The Voices of the Confederation, that Carla Ruckert wrote with Don Elkins, she talks about the channeling experience. And here there's actual channelings from the Confederation on how to channel. They suggest that, as you have read in the messages, all that is needed to begin a meditation group and to initiate contact with these sources of information is the desire to do these things. If you can make contact with an already existing group in your area, that is recommended for the guidance of their more experienced people is helpful. However, a group of people can simply begin a group by holding group meditations at least twice weekly and practicing meditation in some form daily. It is to those who will attempt to contact the Confederation that we discuss this. Perhaps some of the experiences which you may encounter will be described in these interviews with developing channels. Our only word of caution is a request that you seek contact with the Confederation. You seek specifically that cosmic level of information which is beyond all planes of this density, including the astral plane. Astral entities are often very interesting entities with whom to communicate, but their expression will have some degree of the subjective illusion under which those of this density labor. Therefore, their information is not dependable. Consider your consciousness as a radio tuner, and as you desire contact, simply desire the tuned contact. Carla refined her procedure for making contact with any kind of discarnate entities and put her instructions in her 1988 book, A Channeling Handbook, which we were reading from a little bit there. I recommend you read that one to get a better description, a more thorough description. After the Confederation and you have established a dependable contact, Carla says, then these other avenues may be explored. A word about the variety of time spans for the development of these channels. Two of the new instruments, J and M, were professional men in settled professions, which tended to make these de developments a longer process due to the high involvement of the intellect in daily activities. 
Others also experience the difficulty due to intellectual needs of their jobs. Another work with their hands and seemed to progress more quickly, and another was extremely rapidly developing probably because she had been highly trained in Eastern forms of meditation and realization. The longest ever took in Carla's experience for a person who desired to achieve contact with the Confederation was 12 years. On the other hand, there are people that have contacted them within the first week of their meditations. I've witnessed great control with much conditioning, movement of tongue and mouth, and I've seen people achieve contact with little or no conditioning. The youngest channel they've ever seen was 18, and the oldest was 68. The key to the meditations is simply your desire. So the question is, what happens if you get this contact and then one day you decide you don't want it. So the con Confederation abides totally by the law of free will. If you desire their presence, they are there. If you will not accept it, they are gone. One of these new instruments has already stopped coming to the meditation meetings. He tells me that he still meditates, but the meetings and the channeling were not the path for him. This is very acceptable to the Confederation. What it is attempting to do is get its information across to people of Earth that have no strings on those people to whom they have been able to speak. They simply rejoice that they were able to speak. So in one interview, conducted in 1974, the person that they interviewed is named R, and he said, I sat down and tried to quiet myself. And I guess after about 20 minutes, I just realized that I was making all these weird movements with my mouth. And you know, it's stuff I'd done as a kid. I just came to the realization that I'm doing it. I'm doing this and I don't know what it was. I guess maybe a few days later it hit me that it was probably conditioning. Carla then said, And what do you experience now in the way of conditioning? Well, sometimes I'll start as half a yawn. Sometimes I'll be that as I kind of quiet or relax. My mouth will just start opening and then I'll start making all these weird things. Does your tongue move? Carla asked. Yeah, everything moves. It's almost like I'm trying to get out of my body. In fact, I think there there might have been what I thought the first time. As I think about it, it was almost like a yawn. You just couldn't grab a hold of or something. You know, like my jaw was puffed out. Dislocated? Yes, dislocated. I think it can happen. And then a lot of times, it gets really, really tiring. And a lot of times I cop out. I'll say, well, not now. Next time I'll, we'll do it longer because it is kind of a hassle. I don't mean like a pressure. I mean, an energy would be if someone shone a bright light at you behind your back, you could feel it. In another interview with somebody named Jay, they said vocal channeling is an interesting kind of a personal phenomenon. It's kind of hard to describe, however. When I became interested in the possibility of extraterrestrial communication, or for that matter, from even a cockroach that was able to do it, it took a period of about three months of conditioning for me, between three and six hours a day, and at the end of this time I was an awkward channel in that I required a lot of control because I would fight the message. The fact that intrigued me that even though the information was being channeled would change from instrument to instrument, the format and subject matter was also the same. And I'm talking about at a single session, this would be the same thread. In fact, there was an episode where I came in late and I was the last channel used and when the speaker signed off, as it is, he used his name and I was afraid at first to sign off for him, but I proceeded and it was the same channel who had identified himself earlier before I had arrived at the meeting. I have a slight stutter in my speech, but when I channel, I seem to be completely free from it. As to the content of the messages, that's great big argument I always had. Are these my thoughts or other thoughts? When you channel, you get a physical control, but also a thought wave. And the more proficient channels are able to function on the thought wave without a whole lot of physical control. And I was always in an argument with myself or whether the thoughts were mine or someone else's. Carla asks, tell me what physical reactions did you have to conditioning? What did it felt like? Well, it's kind of a weird feeling as if it isn't you. But then again, it has to be you because that's what's causing the popping noise that you hear. There's a lot of tongue wiggling, 
flying open of the jaw and a kind of grunting sound. And when you receive conditioning, you think that something has turned loose in your brain. You have some kind of fit. It actually seems to be quite controlled. And the speakers of whom I channel would have their favorite methods of control. For instance, Hatan would always want to begin the sentence with I or I am, whereas Latos would begin with we or occasionally I. What you have is the word formed in your mind and your jaw seems to move to form it, but it isn't really a conscious effort. I can't seem to put any better because I have, haven't analyzed it completely. In another interview, Carla asks another channeler, just describe what you have felt after two meetings with a group of this type. Well, I started my first experience with conditioning. I was meditating and keeping myself open as a channel of love and light for the Creator, and suddenly my tongue started moving around in my mouth. It was being moved by others than myself, and I received some messages such as, Have no fear, sister, and the word or name Ezekiel came into my head strongly twice. I wasn't familiar with him, although that evening I read all about him in the Bible. George Hunt Williamson also has a chapter that explains who Ezekiel is. And after that, since I was eager to be a channel throughout the day and evening, I would leave myself open and they would start conditioning me. Continue conditioning with my tongue, sort of exercising. And then yesterday I was meditating for about three hours and my whole mouth and face started to move like ours. I got a mirror. And I was watching my face change with all the contortions, exercising the muscles to stimulate the telepathy. I didn't get very far as words, but my mouth was going through the motions of the words. The strongest feeling was when I could feel something creaking in the bones of my face, like something was coming in me. It was very similar to the whole feeling and sound of having a baby. I can't explain it. Anyway, it continues what, whatever I open myself to it. When the big being is coming in you to channel, it's not a grinding sound, but sort of a forcing of another entity in yourself, sort of stretching of your whole frame and structure. It actually makes a noise. Carla says, did you feel anything in your head? I felt all through my head. I was watching my face in the mirror and the whole face was moving. The top of my head was feeling very open too. Were you getting any words? I am Hatan, that was it. And how long has it been since you first experienced this? The two figured together was five days. I was getting a lot of thoughts which I didn't mention because it was without control and I didn't know where it was coming from, whether it was coming from me or where it was coming from, but certain phrases kept being repeated such as, you are an angel and avatar. I didn't know if that was for me, because I guess I don't understand the nature of that. It would never occur to me that I could be possible to look on my past life. Carla didn't really teach a system of channeling. There wasn't a particular school, but she tried to get across a couple of concepts, which was a passive and active phase. And the first concept is that of tuning. She talked about the mind as a radio receiver picking up intelligent invisible signals and relaying them using our physical equipment. And using this analogy, it should be obvious that tuning is all important. There is intuitive tuning and there is discriminative tuning. First, one must tune the passive intuitive mind. This is the mind in relation to itself. Meditation is intended as the chief tool for perfecting this process. In meditation, you are relaxing and releasing the self from its conscious boundaries, but you are doing work of active intuition, also generating a receptive, active, particular inventory vibration, turning actively toward the source of the signal which you will receive and declaring yourself ready to receive fresh thoughts into your waiting conscious mind. In no way does a receptive attitude connote anxiety or anticipation. You must be meditative, relaxed, and accepting of whatever may come. Too much concern and one can easily channel a high percentage of one's own barely unconscious material. Delivering not a majority of cosmic thoughts, but a mismatch of your own half-digested perceptions. Without 
the over-concern, even you are channeling some aspect of your own being, you will be channeling a much clearer version of this same material. When you feel that you have gotten a contact, your discriminating mind comes into action, both towards yourself and towards the source of the contact. Using passive discrimination, you continue focusing, tuning, first with the big knob, then with the smaller and smaller veneers, making finer and finer adjustments, attempting to lift your consciousness to the very highest vibration you can. Only you know when that moment has come. Only you know when you can hold as a steady state. As you are adjusting, you might try singing or chanting or praying. Carla used a selection from a store of songs and chants plus music on tape for preliminary tuning. Or you can use the Lord's Prayer, since it is without doctrine or dogma and can be prayed equally by Muslim, Jew, or Christian, Buddhist, and the honest skeptic. As long as the skeptic will accept the hypothesis that there is a creator. For the very fine tuning, I prefer the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. I have known several channels who have favored the great invocation, and there are many other acceptable and beautiful prayers, including the ones that you make up on the spot, the latter being perhaps the best, as they are expressions of the heart at the exact moment. You are also, once you receive a contact, in need of your actively discriminative faculties in challenging the source that you have contacted. In order to challenge any invisible entity, you must be able to state in a sincere and unequivocal way who you are, what you believe in, and what you love and for what you would die. This is why the beginning of the process of becoming a channel is figuring out how your nature and mind tick. You cannot expect to challenge in the name of Christ if you are of a nature that does not find faith a comfortable emotion. You are not going to be able to challenge in the name of truth if you believe there is no truth and that man can know nothing. Let us say that you are one who believes as the majority of New Age channels seem to do in the Christ, not as Jesus the man, but as a consciousness which Jesus attained during his incarnation. But which is also attainable by any man who can keep his mind, soul, heart and strength fixed upon the Creator. You wish then to challenge in the name of Christ consciousness. You feel or you guess that this is something that you can believe in. In this very complex society, we are not used to saying things in a way which implies no relativity. We are used to situational ethics, wrong things being right under certain circumstances, and people leaving our religious beliefs pretty much alone in the interest of getting along with each other. It may be difficult for you to say unequivocally that you would die before you would deny the supremacy of the force of Christ consciousness in your life. It is possible for you to doubt the ideal because of the age in which we live. This is not an age of faith unless it is faith in empirically derived knowledge. We know that all technology is going to be improved upon and so even the newest gadgets are looking upon with a mixture of awe and the cynical thought that if we wait just a little longer, the technology will improve. It is difficult to put our minds out back into the world unshakable ideals and eternal truths. And yet if channeling has a real place in expanding our knowledge of the way things are, then it has that because it speaks of unchangeable truths, helping us to perceive them better, more simply and more directly. So you do your best to tune. You can do it through prayer and you continue to tune. When you have tuned correctly, so that each prayer and thought which you have tuned is a meaningful and substantial statement of your belief system, then your challenging should be very easy because you will have attracted an entity which is capable of communicating about that which you embrace. There's so much more to talk about in terms of specific channels that are interesting and ways to channel. I do recommend a book called Opening to Channel written by Sanaya Roman and Dwayne Packer that is very good on instructions to channel. There's some great coaches out there. Kevin Young is one that has taught channeling. 
but it's a choice that you have to make. I am more interested in reading the channeled information and using this information to build a better understanding of the universe. I don't necessarily feel a need to channel myself except when it comes to myself and how I can be of greater service. And I have that assistance with my own higher self, which is me. But I do talk about channeling a lot on the channel. And I am never trying to say that this is the absolute truth. I'm going down the rabbit hole to follow this information. And I am just like you, questioning it all the way. But I do find that some of this information is fascinating and I love to share it with you. And so that is my position on it. And I would like to know, are you a channel? Maybe I can interview you on the show. I love to interview channels. In any case, please leave a comment about your experience with channels. Who's your favorite channel? Recommend a YouTube video of a cool channel that I, I would love to see because I'm always interested. I do believe this information will become helpful in the future. We will look back on some of these channeled readings as being incredibly prophetic and powerful in establishing the way the universe works and key philosophical points about existence and reality. Thank you for sharing this with me. Can't wait. There's so many awesome new episodes coming soon. Some great meditations on the way. I love you so much and I'm sending out love and happiness, imagining the very best for you. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can usually be found at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to The Reality Revolution.